Welcome back, everyone. Paul Chamberlain, the Air Force guy, here with everything RV's podcast. We're here to bring you the information. Whether you're new to camping, meaning RVs, that is, uh, or for, even for those experienced campers, uh, we want to go ahead and give you the information that you need so that you can make memories that will last a lifetime. And tonight, we're going to be talking about this is some, this is a topic that comes up all the time. Let me go ahead and just share share my screen here, just show you what I'm talking about. We get this all the time, and that is dealing with solar. So tonight, I am so excited to go ahead and bring with you a special bring on here a special guest, and that is that is dealing with off grid RV setups, giving people the opportunity that they go ahead and go do some boondocking. Because that is something that a lot of people are looking for. And so without further ado, let me bring on Nick here. Give me a moment, Nick. I'm going to get you set up here. But uh, here is Nick from OffGridRVs.com here in the Georgia area. I'll tell you, Nick, I appreciate you coming out, uh, spending, taking your time out of your busy night uh, to go ahead and at least come on here and give the folks the information they need. So in the event that they want to upgrade to solar, they have that necessary information for this. Yeah, well, I appreciate you uh, letting me come on, Paul. Well, it's a, quite the honor to be here for sure. I know you're a, you're a big name in the RV and, and camper industry, and uh, so it's just a pleasure to be here. I'm glad that glad that we're so close. That you know you're only about an hour and 15 minutes north of me. Um, so right. Well, I'll tell you, you know. So just to let everybody know how we met. Uh, one day I'm, I'm looking at a, a motor home sitting out in the front of our building. And there was two guys standing by the uh, welcome area. And, you know, I go out, I take some pictures of this motor home. It's a, it was a Winnebago view. This thing, it, the whole roof was solar panels. And I'm looking at it going, what the heck is this? You know, and of course I come in, get talking to these two guys. They're in there to introduce uh, what they do for RVs. And I was quite impressed with the, that the fact this thing had 2,800 watts of solar. And you told me that, now I don't know that I believe this, I'd have to see it in person, but <laughs> you told me that it would operate for two days, everything with four and a half hours worth of solar. I mean, sun. I may have said that, but I misspoke. Uh, it can okay. operate indefinitely with four and a half hours of sunlight every two days. Oh, it, it, oh so I'll code it back up. It could do what again? It can operate indefinitely, like run the AC, run the mini split air conditioning, run the refrigerator. Basically, the family live in it indefinitely as long as it gets four and a half hours of sunlight every two days. Dude, that is amazing. You know, I tell you, because I've interviewed other people that do solar, and I tell you, it's been probably five, six years maybe. And uh, it's amazing the advancement of solar, and I'm sure it's only going to get better. Now, for that particular system, because I think it was critical, and I think probably one of the reasons why it's able to do that is because of the fact that you guys, I think, and maybe you can, you can expound on this, but I think it had a lot to do with the fact that, of course, all the solar you had, but how effect, effective or efficient the charge controller is for that system. Can you explain how that yeah, plays in, in a role in that? Yeah, for sure. It, it does play a minor role for sure because uh, some charge controllers might only be 80% efficient or 85% efficient and we're in the upper 90s on the charge controller. But we're, it's really just this, on this particular build, um, it was a little unusual. We use the charge controller that's built into a solar converter. So we put a residential UL listed inverter on this Winnebago view. Uh, but really, I'd say that the primary reason why we're able to operate, or that client's able to operate that um, RV indefinitely on minimal solar is because it it has a 12 volt like a compressor based refrigerator and also because we put a mini split air conditioning on it with a built-in heat pump so the, the the biggest energy hogs on rvs and campers by far is the factory the oem ac units and then the absorption based refrigerators so you're talking the rv style refrigerator so but these 12 volts are much more efficient that's right and even a lot of, uh, I've noticed a trend with 
some RV manufacturers and even camper manufacturers, they're even putting 12 volt compressor based fridges on their new units. So it, it seems like they're noticing the trend also that people are tired of these inefficient absorption based, like a dual fuel refrigerator, one that'll run off propane or 120 volts electricity. Well, and I think, and I, and I was just talking to someone today, and I think the reason why people like the dual fuel, you know, fuel, meaning one LP, the other being 110, is because the fact that they could run it on the propane for so long using battery power versus the 12 volt, um, 12 volt fridges. That's, you know, but now keep in mind now, that it's not like they have a lot of solar and they don't have the amp hour batteries that we're talking about that you put with your builds. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the, with the RV world, uh, the boondocking world, it's it's very similar to the residential world. You don't get solar because it makes sense. Like there's a three year return on that investment uh, with the money that you're going to save. You really get solar on your RV and camper because of the convenience. It's very similar to going to CVS. You stop at a CVS or a Walgreens at the corner and you know that you're going to spend three times the amount of money for that Gatorade, but you're willing to do it because of the convenience. It's the same concept. Right. So the, the solar just offers you a tremendous amount of freedom to go boondocking. So now what, what type of RVs are, can, can you upgrade for solar? So uh, I, I haven't discovered a limit yet uh, with what we can upgrade for solar, but typically it's, it's easiest to upgrade the systems that, ha that come with some kind of factory inverter system. Those are typically the easiest to upgrade. Uh, but that's not the only ones you can upgrade. You can also upgrade uh, campers that maybe had no solar options, no factory inverter whatsoever. They just came with a, a converter um, and, and even older ones. Like we're, we're finishing up a build on a 2018 camper uh, right now. Uh, so it's a, it's an older one, came with no, no solar or inverter options. It just came with a, a lead acid battery from the factory and a converter. And so we're, we're going to make it to where it's completely off-grid as well. Gotcha. Now, so now what size camper is that one? It's a 33 foot with a slide. It's actually a lower end. It's a, it's a forest river camper, um, but it was built well. It's a good build quality. Um, but so we're swapping out the refrigerator. So instead of the absorption based dual fuel fridge, we're putting a 12 volt. Oh, sorry. Actually, we're putting a 120 volt residential fridge. Uh, we actually got it from Lowe's. Uh, okay. Just because it fit the space fit the hole almost perfectly. So now the refrigerator capacity uh, is is about 70% greater than what it was with the absorption-based refrigerator. And it fits in the same hole. It's the same opening. And it runs off 120 volts and consumes one-fifth the amount of electricity to operate. Oh, wonderful. Gotcha. Now, so, so now how much solar are you putting on the roof of that uh, travel trailer? That one has... Uh, I think it's 3,200 watts we're putting on that one. Um, I think it's 3,200. 30, Dang. Okay. And then how, how many amp hour in, in the batteries are you installing? So we put a 51.2 volt battery uh, that is 300 amp hour inside that one. Okay. So it's 15 now, amp hour. So I, and I think explain to the people that are listening or watching here on YouTube, and by the way, folks, I will have his contact information, his website down below. As you saw it, I had it earlier, and that was the offgridrvs.com. So I'll have that listed down below. But can you explain to the uh, to people that are listening the difference between a 12-volt battery and the type of batteries that you're putting in, in the uh, campers? Yeah, so, so we... We do our best to stick to only lithium, <clears throat> excuse me, lithium iron phosphate batteries. So it's a, it's a, it's a different variation of lithium. It's not like the lithium batteries that are in your cell phones. That, like if you hit it with a hammer, it's likely to catch fire. It's a lithium iron phosphate is a very safe chemistry. Um, it's, it's a, um, it weighs about half the weight, half, half as much as a lead acid battery or an AGM battery. And it'll have twice the capacity within the same envelope. So um, we're a lot of our builds, we're doing 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries, and we'll wire several of those in parallel. Um, so we'll have maybe 400 amp hours if we wire four of those in parallel together. 
uh, on the build that we're talking about with that Winnebago view, we actually elected to put um, 51.2 volt, which is um, 51.2 volt, 300 amp hours. So if you, it's the equivalent of about, um, let's see, three times four. It's the equivalent of about 12, 12 volt, 100 amp hour batteries. Okay. Um, so we just put one big one of those. It's got a 10 year warranty, a built in heater. So it won't, um, the, the one, one challenge with lithium iron phosphate batteries is that, uh, you don't want to charge them whenever it's below, I think it's around 25 degrees or th it might be 31 degrees Fahrenheit. You don't want to charge them when they're below that temperature because you'll damage the crystal structure. You'll damage the chemicals that are inside of it. So you have to preheat right. the battery before you charge it. So we only install batteries that have those heaters built in so that now you can go in any climate and not, not at risk of damaging any of your equipment. What do you do? What do you do? Because the other the other aspect of these lithium batteries is not being able to recharge when they get too hot. So what do you do as far as for the area that these batteries are in? Do you have some type of cooling fan or you're pulling some um, cool from inside the RV to cool these batteries or what? Yeah, it's certainly a consideration, right? You want to make sure you have good airflow. But if you're putting the batteries in an air conditioned space to begin with, uh, it's simply a matter of putting a fan and a ventilation, uh, a simple vent, uh, not a big deal. Uh, right. But Perfect. really, they're only getting hot whenever they're they're you're operating them at their limit. So if you slightly over engineer the system, they're never going to approach their limit of capacity, okay. which means they're not going to get hot. Well, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I meant more like, you know, they're out there in Arizona. Yeah. And then, you know, the heat or whatever, or maybe that's down right. in Florida and it's and it's hot out there. But uh, that's what I was talking about. But uh, what is your typical retro time frame for somebody if they're going to be going to, you know, like you're doing on that Forest River travel trailer? What type of a time frame are they looking at for something like that? Yeah. So with that, that travel trailer, uh, you know, we're doing some extensive stuff. We're changing the factory. AC unit to a mini split. Uh, we're also swapping out the refrigerator. They um, swapping out the sink instead of the factory plastic sink. We put a nice stainless steel sink and faucet in. So we're doing some kind of ancillary projects with it, changing the wheels and tires. They're just doing several upgrades. And so that's about a three week project. That's about 15 business days um, and okay. for the complete conversion. But some conversions we do, like they're, they're not as extensive. Like we're just changing the AC unit. And so we might be able to do that in two days, depending on if they want a mini split or if they just want like a, a quiet, um, like a, a Hooten AC unit. So if they're trying to reduce decibel level by maybe 15 dB, uh, so now they can have a conversation, but they're not they're not looking for something that's off grid that we can do those in a day. Uh, okay. So we have, um, I know recently we did some upgrades on a, on a different Winnebago Navion and um, basically the guy just wanted us us to prepare the whole chassis so that six months a year from now he can double the battery capacity and so we installed a converter and basically an extra charger so he can charge quickly um it just depends on the size of the project so we're we're really hands-on we're involved we're, we're here to meet the customer needs like we're not just selling standard kits hopefully this fits you it's what what are you looking for you're just trying to get two or three days of boondocking or do you want to be able to go the entire night every night with running the AC unit and you're not concerned about running the AC during the day because you're not in the RV. Um, so each one of our builds are custom. So to further answer your question though, we don't book more than one install per week. So um, we know at time of booking, if the project is going to take more than one week. And so if so, we go ahead and block off the next week, but um, we it just gives us plenty of time in case there's something unforeseen, or maybe we discover water damage from a previous install, or maybe from the OEM build, we can remedy that damage before we put on the new um, the new power system. So now, one thing I noticed that you covered when when I saw your the Winnebago view that you came in was the fact that you're taking out these um, RV type ACs and putting in the mini splits. Um, explain to the listeners here and the people watching the benefit of going from these RV ACs to a mini split? Yeah. Yeah. Great question, Paul. Uh, you're good at this game for sure. <laughs> so that the, the best thing really is that my, my favorite aspect is that they can, a mini split is going to consume one fourth or one fifth the amount of electricity of a traditional rooftop RV AC unit. And it's coupled with 
the heat pump is just as efficient. So during the winter time, it'll produce, produce the same amount of heat on very little electricity. So to put numbers to that, a factory OEM rooftop AC unit is going to consume between 1,500 and 1,800 watts to operate continuously. Uh, you put it on low speed, it might drop 60 watts. It's not going to drop a whole lot. Uh, when the compressor turns off, it's going to drop another 120 watts maybe. But overall, you're still always consuming at least 1,300 watts, no matter what condition that thing is running. So if you wow. switch to a mini split, you're at, at peak performance, like a, a like on that Winnebago view, for instance, and the, the peak of summer, running that mini split wide open. It's an 18,000 BTU mini split. Uh, I've seen it pull 780 watts at peak. Wow. So that's half the power, but most of the day, it's actually only pulling about 350 or 400 watts. So it's a huge okay. drop in power consumption. But that's a, that's probably my favorite aspect just from the technical standpoint. But other than that, I really enjoy the fact that you can now stand underneath the AC unit on your cell phone and have a conversation. They're so quiet. But there, there, was, a, there was another benefit you told me about. Do you remember? Yeah. The warranty, yeah. right? Yeah, they all, yeah, I really like, I know, I'm sure there's other brands that would do this, but Pioneer um, is, is the primary brand we've sought after for installing mini splits on RVs. And it's because they said that installing these on RVs and campers in no way violates their warranty because they know we're doing a robust build and we're protecting their unit. Um, so this thing can vibrate down the road for hundreds of miles a day and it doesn't change the warranty at all. So these will come from the factory with between five and 10 year warranties on every mini split that we, we install from them, which is pretty awesome. And I think, I think that's impressive because, you know, most RV ACs, you know, you typically get your one year warranty, then maybe, maybe you might have a two or three year warranty on it uh, for most part, but to have a five, 10 year warranty on the AC system, that's pretty impressive. Now, what about, cause you mentioned that you're putting more of a residential style charge controller in these rvs is that correct or is that uh, so, just on that one yeah just on that one winnebago view the one that we brought by your place we had put a, a residential yes. a ul listed solark uh, inverter in that one but it was a that was a special case right the, the owner of that one wants to be able to this is how he operates he lives in in a rural area and so when the power goes out he wants to be able to this is what he does he plugs his rv into his house into a generator inlet and so now he can keep the well running and keep all of the toilets running and all the faucets running in his house. He can keep his refrigerators and freezers going, keep all the lights on in the whole house, all from his RV. So, and now it's quiet, right? Because the RV is getting sunlight. It's got a battery bank. So it's powering his house. Not the fact, it's not powering the AC units because those are traditional AC units that consume a lot of power, but it's powering basically everything else so that he can keep his household in operation just from, from his RV. And uh, just kind of yeah. a novel thing he can charge his... Right. He charges EV too, charges electric vehicle. I mean, how long? How long does is he able to run his house on something like that? Yeah, so it, it depends on if it's overcast or not, and it also depends on okay. how many appliances he's running inside the house. If you're running the washing okay. machine, it's not going to be very long. If you're running the dishwasher, it's not going to be very long. Uh, it might okay. it might only be uh, six or eight hours or something, um, but if if all you're doing is keeping lights on, keeping refrigerators going and the well pump running to keep water flowing to the faucets, right. um, I think he could easily get uh, 15 hours if he received zero sunlight. Okay. But one I thing that's neat is uh, that customer actually also has a uh, drives a hybrid vehicle. He has a, a Toyota Camry. And uh, so this was a kind of a special project, but it was pretty neat. We, we made it so that he can plug his hybrid Camry into his RV to recharge the battery bank. How long does that take him to recharge his, his car? No, I'm not talking about recharging his car. I'm saying he can use his car to recharge the battery bank in the RV. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. I, okay. I, 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 I misunderstood yes. that. So, so, so the okay. idea is the grid is down and right. it's cloudy because there's a hurricane coming or something. And so you're not getting solar. He could start the generator on the Winnebago to recharge the batteries. That works, right? Or he could plug in his hybrid vehicle to his RV to recharge the batteries, to keep power in the house, keep everything in the freezers good so none of that stuff spoils. And we all and know how long, that take, how long does that take the car to charge the batteries in the motorhome? 
So it's going to be on demand. It operates on demand. So it's only if um, it, it really depends. I mean, the, the, the batteries in, in those hybrid vehicles, like in the Camry, is about 270 volts DC. So if you're pulling 20 amps at 270 volts, like you're still pulling 5,000 watts. So that'll charge things pretty quickly. Okay. Well, good. So now, um, what type of a wait period do you have right now? in the event that somebody were to call you and wanted to, you know, sit down and, and try to work something out? Yeah. Uh, great, great question. Um, I know earlier this week we were booked out till November 11th, but we actually just had a client just drop off his RV today who booked that slot. So we're, uh, we're several, we're, we're over, over two months out right now is the waiting list for doing installs, which is just fine. Okay. I mean, we've got to get materials in for doing your build too. And, um, you got to get your RV or camper to us unless you want a mobile install, which just takes a little bit more time. Um, so yeah, right, right now we're, I think it's the third week of November is our next opening. Gotcha. Now, so do you do like just regular installs of, of, uh, solar panels and batteries and so forth as well? You say regular, do you mean, um, uh, on RVs and campers still? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So if somebody just wants something supplemental, like almost like novelty, like, Hey, I want to be able to run the lights or run just my, just my refrigerator. I'm not concerned about running the AC unit. Yes, sir. That's no problem. And we just so, so that because I see this come up all the time, and I know with my camper I didn't have an issue with, but I for some reason I see this happening now, and it's an issue. But I have a hundred watt solar panel on my camper, and I have just a regular deep cycle battery. Yeah, I dropped my camper off in the middle of a parking lot in Tampa, Florida. Now keep in mind, also it was, uh, you know about new year around jan first week of january uh time frame so it wasn't real real hot out and my refrigerator ran the whole week while i went ahead and stayed at a hotel but how big of a solar panel does somebody need and how much amp hours in a battery do they need if they have a 12 volt refrigerator to do something like that does your camper have a 12 volt refrigerator or is it, it does. Absorbed? okay yeah, great. Yeah, that's wonderful. So uh, I think it, it just depends on, on, on what the needs are, right? So if somebody has a 12 volt refrigerator, you're asking uh, how much solar do they need? And you said you have one lead acid battery. Is that correct? An AGM battery? Yep. Or it? No, it was just a regular deep cycle, you know, battery. Okay. So, so maybe it's, it's like a 24 type. Is that what it is? Okay. So it's maybe a 100. 120 amp hour or something so so i mean there's oh no no it's it's like four it's like 40 amp hour battery oh really it's small yeah it's yeah it's not that big yeah great that's wonderful so yeah i mean it sounds like that's a that's enough power for that specific 12 volt refrigerator that's wonderful so i'm guessing that's probably only consuming maybe 50 watts or something well but see i i've had i've had people tell me that when they went ahead and tried to run their refrigerator, it only ran for a day. And they yeah. have a solar panel and it, you know, they say they're in full sun. I just don't, I don't understand how that, how that happens. Well, I mean, to me, I would uh, think there would be a problem with the system if that were the case. Were you living in it? Were you staying in it uh, during that weekend? No, I had a, no, I left it in a parking lot. The only thing running was the, was the refrigerator. And uh, you're sure it was staying cold the whole time? You don't think that it was cycling at nighttime or anything? It, I, I went over, checked every, I, I went over like, like every other day, looked yeah. at the battery. The battery said it was two thirds full and I looked in the refrigerator. It seemed fine. Didn't have an issue whatsoever. That's the good. beer was still cold. The beer was still cold when I picked it up to, and got to my next place. So All right. good to go there. <laughs> and I mean, I had milk and cheese and eggs and I mean, we had food in it. Yep. So but anyway, I just thought I'd ask the question. I know it's kind yeah. of a it's kind of hard to figure that out. But listen, I appreciate you uh, stopping on here, kind of going over those things. It's it amazes me that now there is ways that you can do what you're telling me we can do, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be happy knowing that you know what there's a solution, um, and there's ways to go ahead and get those things done. That they've always wanted to have done yeah yeah i think there's lots of lots of options for the freedom that people are looking for nowadays well, i'll tell you until i met you guys 
until I met you guys, I was telling people, <laughs> you can't do what you're asking. So it, it was what they're working with. I didn't realize that things had changed that much. So yeah, it was awesome. Yeah, it's, so, a, it's a fun industry to be in for sure. No doubt. Well, listen, man, I appreciate you taking time out of, out of your day, as we say. Now, let me ask you, for those people that are watching, uh, if they were to contact you, is there anything, any special deal that you'd like to give to them? Uh, yeah, so I, I give a 15-minute free consultation for sure. So um, you just want to talk about, maybe talk through a problem that you're having or maybe talk about what you would like to do and see what the possibility is or just get a rough idea of what that cost would be or time frame. Um, yeah, happy to happy to help. So right on my website, there's a there's a button to just book a 15 minute call and it's tied into my calendar. So based on my availability, you just pick a time that works for you, works for your schedule Beautiful. and I'll be happy to help you however I can. I, I promise awesome. you'll get you'll get value in that 15 minutes. That's awesome. Well, listen, I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule and uh, we'll get this out and uh, get some people calling you. Sounds great. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you now. Take great care. Day. Yes, sir, you too.